Um, I am actually not a teenager. I am the owner of the Discovery Space Center, headquartered here in Pleasant Grove, and I'm also the most recent uh, GOP chairman for Utah County for the last couple of years. Um, I was Mia Love's 2012 campaign manager up through the convention cycle, not when she lost. Uh, that was when she started to get known by everybody. Then I went to Arizona, managed a campaign there. And most recently, I've accepted a position with Congressman Stewart's campaign team as their campaign chairman. So I'm actively involved in politics. I get asked to moderate these debates occasionally because I uh, do my very best to, to be as fair as possible. I reached out to the candidates who I have the phone numbers of throughout the day today uh, to touch bases. And I've also provided them with a copy of uh, the rules that I typically like to use during these debates and discussions. Um, first of all, uh, we're going to go ahead and begin with a prayer and then uh, the pledge. The presentation of the colors will be by VFW Post 4918's Color Guard. Um, the prayer will be said by Barbara Langford and the pledge will be led by Les Langford. Let's go ahead and go prayer and then posting of the colors and then pledge. Uh, Barbara. Our Heavenly Father, we are and be grateful to be members of this lovely community, Pleasant Grove, Utah. We're gathered here this evening to share ideas and to learn more about our community and uh, possible uh, community leaders in the future. We ask thy spirit to be with us, that we may be cordial and full of ambition and enthusiasm for each other, that we may pursue new ideas and listen openly with open hearts and minds to new ideas and those ideas that the candidates have uh, determined are important for our community. Help us to value each other and to understand that it is this type of opportunity that we have to improve our community and to build our, our futures together. We're so grateful for all the many blessings that we enjoy and we dedicate this time to thee and we say these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Audience, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Color Guard, post color. audience may be seated. Okay, thank you uh, to Les, Barbara, and the VFW, um, and especially also thank you to Craig Thorne, uh, the organizer for tonight's event. Um, I can tell you, after running meetings like these for the last couple of years, 
that a meeting that Craig is not involved in is a meeting where the flag doesn't show up. And uh, we just barely had one. Uh, Carly Fiorina was here in Utah, and the state GOP had a big, fun big fundraiser, and I show up, and I'm just sitting there to eat food, and all of a sudden, uh, when we stood up, we started pledging allegiance to a brick wall. So um, that is something that I'm very grateful for Craig for, and uh, that kind of stuff always is made possible by volunteers like him. Um, also, um, the debate rules and questions. Um, well, the, the questions, I have a stack of questions that were submitted by uh, citizens and residents of Pleasant Grove that Craig Thorne uh, gave to me. I also have questions that I put together, and after conversing with the candidates, I put together a series of um, discussion items as well. Um, the debate uh, rules will be as follows. The audience will refrain from comments, sounds, noises, and applause until the moderator directs the audience in applause at the end of the debate. What this does is it allows us to have this be a discussion where we can hear all the candidates and maximize the time rather than have interruptions. Um, as a campaign manager, I know one of the strategies is to try to stack a debate audience so that way you can uh, get your guy to get all the cheers or your gal, and uh, that's not the purpose of tonight's debate. We have eight candidates and a lot to hear from them on. The moderator will select the questions. The moderator will indicate how long the response time is to each question. Um, moderate, and those questions will be uh, anywhere from 30 seconds to 2 minutes long. Um, and so candidates can prep right now, you'll have a 90 second intro. Moderator will cut off candidates after they run more than 5 seconds over at the moderator's discretion. I have at the moderator's discretion here because sometimes they literally are just wrapping up a concept and we, we do want to make sure that we're understanding what's being said. If they're consistently uh, wrapping up 10 seconds over, then that's when I start to really interrupt. Um, candidates will have 90 seconds to introduce themselves and explain to the audience why they are running. A different candidate will start with each question rotating down the table of candidates. So we'll begin um, on this end with uh, Jay Lynn Walker and then proceed down. And then the next time we will hear from Eric Jensen for that. Uh, he will be the first person to respond and then uh, Don Paz, and so on and so forth. Um, any candidate who is named by another candidate in a positive or a negative way will get extra time given to them at the discretion of the moderator. Uh, this discourages them from my mentioning each other um, by name. Also, uh, if they're allies, the reason it's at the discretion of the moderator is if you're constantly mentioning your ally's name, uh, that gives them extra time, and that's not fair either. So that's why there's the discretion. You know. um, this isn't my first rodeo. Candidates <laughs> can request for a time extension at any point during the debate, and their time will be extended by 60 seconds. So at any point during tonight's discussion, they can just say, I'd like to use my extra minute. Um, that can be here at the beginning as they introduce themselves. It can be because they felt like they weren't clear on an answer, or they'd like more time to elaborate, or... Um, uh, they would uh, like to wrap up with 60 seconds extra at the very end. The moderator can ask a follow-up question to clarify positions of any candidates on any questions with time uh, for follow-up questions at, at the discretion of the moderator. I typically don't do this, but if I do, it's because of a lack of clarity usually from on, on a specific answer, and we only have so much time with each of you, so we want specifics. Um, the, and any other rules, this is my favorite. Uh, that seem appropriate at the moderator's discretion during the course of the debate. So if there's something that's obviously uh, a unique problem that I'm not aware of, uh, we might have to create new boundaries. Um, equal speaking time for candidates will be an objective of the moderator. So I, I appreciate the candidates uh, agreeing to having me moderate the, this debate. Those of you that aren't familiar with me, I, I definitely am very committed and interested in fairness. I plan on doing these debates for a long time, so I'm not planning on ruining it by being super unfair one night with a couple of candidates that I don't know. Um, <laughs> equal speaking time, uh, again, so the, the way the time will be kept is uh, down here in, in the front. We'll have three different uh, colors that indicate three different things. The candidates can very hopefully easily see them. Uh, the one that she's holding up right now, the 15 second one, is the most difficult to see. The red ink means stop, and it has a big stop on it. 
Uh, yellow ink means 15 more seconds to speak, and the green ink means one more minute to speak. Um, she'll hold those up, and then hopefully you see them, and if you don't, that's how it goes. She's not going to jump up and down trying to get you to see it, because that would distract you, and then there'd be accusations of unfairness. So we're going to be as uh, forthright in all of this as possible. Also, um, debate objectives are for the people that are here tonight to be able to go home uh, with a clear understanding of the candidate's position. Uh, I believe that a moderator, being asked to moderate one of these debates, is much like being asked to say the prayer in church. People only notice me if I mess up. So my goal is to ask questions in such a way that allows you guys the opportunity to shine and to um, stand out on what you're running on and what your goals are for this community. Um, from there, do the candidates have any questions? Is there anything they need clarification on? Perfect. An audience, are we on board with the no noises thing? Okay, great, thank you. Um, very good, no noise response to that question. That's perfect. Um, let's go ahead and go to the first question, which is very simple. It's, uh, why are you running? And tell us a little about yourself. And you have 90 seconds to answer this. Yep, you, you'll probably want to stay seated the whole time just because your microphone doesn't have a height extension, so I would just recommend staying seated. And I have to stay standing until a chair is down for me, so. Hi, I'm Lynn Walker. I'm running for office because I want to see Pleasant Grove City go forward, not backward. I want to see the utilities repaired, and I think that that's going to uh, be interesting how we work that out. Especially the road. The reality those getting fixed, they're costing you more dollars every day that you're not getting in repair. I uh, have lived here most of my life, uh, over 50 years, and I have got the background uh, in this type of work, and I've had that background for well over 50 years, and have uh, many jobs that have been built successfully. I've yet to lose money on any job that I've been involved with. I uh, would like to be very careful to make sure that the employees of the city are being taken care of and watched over, and that is what I'm after. Eric Jensen, I've lived in Pleasant Grove for about 24 years with my wife and three children. We've all graduated and come through two Vikings. Excited to be here tonight. Thank you for coming. Some of my issues is I want to see the roads that you're taking care of. Public safety and economic development are key in our, our growing community. We, we're just not a small town anymore. We have to realize that. We have aging infrastructure that's happening in Pleasant Grove. We need to address those issues. That's just something that doesn't happen overnight. We have to look at the long-term solutions for our city. I'm excited for our community. We're, we have economic growth coming to our city, and it's good to see that. It's an opportunity we have in with the library, the rec programs, the pool, everything makes our community important to live in. That's why I moved here, because I, I felt that, that, that love of pleasant growth, and that's why I wanted to raise my kids here. And thank you. Hi, my name is Don Paz. I'm running for city council because I've been working with the city for a number of years and I see some things in the city that I think I can take my expertise. Happens in a city that in a, in a government where the people aren't involved, so I've decided to, to spend my life being involved in the city and, and other levels of government. I've worked uh, my whole career for uh, doing different kind of uh, programs, managing contracts in excess of $100 million. And I was successful in doing that as I surrounded myself with people that were stronger where I'm weak and being able to pull off contracts, bring them in on time and under budget. I think I can take the same thing in the difficult financial situation we're going to face going forward and use those to help city workers city council members, and especially the citizens, understand what limitations we have, what we can do with those limitations, and encourage city participation in making those decisions. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Sid Lamone, and I've been sitting on the city council since 2012. And people have been asking me why I want to do this again, and to be honest, I'm asking myself that on a regular basis as well, this, during the heat of campaign season. But there's a couple reasons. One is that there's a huge learning curve that comes with being a city council member. There's no training manual, there's no job shadowing, every week is different. And just to be able to get comfortable and feel like you know what you're doing takes quite a while. So I feel like just now I'm getting the momentum and confidence as a council member to really make, continue to make a difference for the next four years. I feel confident in what I've done in the past four years. Are, some, are there some things I would have done different? Absolutely. But that's what we learn from, and that's what we grow from, and that's how I can continue to make the next four years positive as well. My husband and I have three boys, and we're raising them here in Pleasant Grove. I think next to Lynn, I've been the council member that's lit, or the candidate that's lived here the last <coughs> 36 years. I want my boys to want to live here, and I think that's why many of you are here tonight too, because you want this future for Pleasant Grove to be for your children or your grandchildren. I appreciate you coming out tonight because I think that's why we're all here in this room to make sure our future in Pleasant Grove is secure and that we're making the best decisions as council members that we can to make sure your family wants to make their home here. I want my kids to want to be as passionate as Pleasant Grove as I am, and that's why I'm here running for city council, and I hope to serve you and your family for another four years. Thank you. I'm Blaine Thatcher. Uh, I've lived here in Pleasant Grove for about 23 years. Uh, my wife and I have raised our three children here, and uh, we have very much enjoyed uh, living in Pleasant Grove. Um, I'm an accountant, and uh, I have a degree from the School of Accountancy at Brigham Young University. And for the last 30 years, I've been working in the accounting profession. Uh, I currently run my own accounting firm, and I provide uh, services to small businesses, uh, helping them develop their own accounting and management information systems. So we help them produce the management information they need to make wise business decisions. So that's, uh, that's what I do, that's my background. I got into uh, this race, I guess, because uh, about a year ago I started looking into the financial statements of the city. and. Uh, with the bond debates that have been going on, I, I wanted to know what was going on, you know, really uh, in the city and with the numbers. And the deeper I dug, the more concerned I became. Uh, I became concerned enough that I said, I'm going to have to step up and, and run to help, I think, turn this around. And I uh, never thought I would be doing this, but here I am running for city council. So. Hello, my name is Matt Gosby. And I've lived here with my family for a while, and we're a wife and six kids, everything from 11 to 1. And we love the parks, we love the work center, we love the, the community here in, in Pleasant Grove. Um, we did move from Seattle, so I got my bachelor's in civil engineering and my master's in structural engineering from the University of Washington. And then we moved out here, my parents and some of my other family, and my big uh, pioneer heritage have been here for a while, so we moved back. And I started getting involved because, as a structural, from the, my structural engineering background, the public safety building concerned me with some of the studies that we had. I didn't like the amount of information that we had. I did not think it was sufficient. And from that, I started looking into the roads as well. And from the civil engineering side of things, I, I saw a lot of concerns <coughs> with the subsurface infrastructure, the pipes, basically, underneath the road. Um, and for those reasons, I started attending city council meetings and getting involved in the and what I found is, on a deeper level, the, the major reason why I started, I decided to run was because of our financial issues. I think the reason that we have the problems with our subsurface and with the roads and with the public safety building is because our finances are on an unsustainable path. We're on a trajectory that will not be able to support the increased population or the, the businesses that are here. So from that aspect, I found that we really need to change the way that we have been budgeting and the way that we are managing the money here in the city. And for those reasons, I decided to run. Hello, I'm Jennifer Baptista. I've been living in Southern Grove for 10 years. I have been a full-time volunteer for the entire 10 years. Um, I've uh, volunteered my time with the city through the Arts Commission and I'm currently on the Planning Commission. Um, I have spent a lot of time in the schools working with our, our children and doing stuff like that. I have um, been involved with politics and I have been able to um, be involved with our citizens in several different um, things. I've done a petition, I was a sponsor of a petition against the 
the ERC that's coordinated on the program, and I helped organize the Miller Society of Utah County in collecting um, almost 18,000 signatures. Um, I'm running because um, I think that I can help the spot in solution and, and be more creative and trying to find ways to solve some of our major problems that we don't have a revenue for to address. And I think that our citizens' involvement has been lacking in some areas, and I think that we need to try harder to educate our citizens on our financial situation and let them be part of the discussion and the decision going forward on whether or not we want to, how we want to address the problems that we are facing. We have some really big financial situations that we have to deal with, and I think the citizens really need to have a, you know, a say and have you know, a part in making those decisions. If we're going to ask you to pay for them, I think you should know what we're, what we're trying to do. So, thank you. I'm Jill Lett. My husband and I have lived here in Southern Gulf for nearly six years. We have ten children. Um, the reason I run for city council is because I was checking my emails one afternoon and I saw that there were three seats available for city council and I had the thought I need to run for city council and I kind of laughed it off and went on with my day. Later in the day I was reconfirming that some information on another issue on that email and I had that thought again. I need to run for city council. I have learned that when I have those thoughts that I need to act upon them for the next day I went in and signed up to run for city council. In the meantime, I have begun to learn what I believe are some of the reasons why I am running in managing a family and living on a responsible budget. We, if there's not money in the budget, then we want to either do without or make do or find other ways to do things. And with some of the issues that we have concerning our budget here, I'd like to bring the experience that I have and help the community in seeing what we need to do and how to work best together. I also have learned to listen to others and to see point of views from, from all different sides. And from doing that, I think that I can, from that experience, I feel that I can have a lot to offer. So. Thank you. This next question, you'll notice this with a few of the questions, they're going to feel like you just don't have enough time, but that's because we'd like to cover a lot of topics. Um, you, in 30 seconds, can you quickly tell us what in your background prepares you to handle, um, well, what in your background preps you for the job of a city council member? Uh, 30 seconds. Let's go ahead and start with Eric. So I've had a background, I'm a former business owner, I currently work for the city of Orem as a member administrator. But my background is, is dealing with people and understanding people and where they're coming from and gaining the information and then moving forward as a city council member. When you work on a city council, I've been out for about uh, three months, you have to disclose that information to the citizens and understand where they're coming from and then move forward with that decision. You elect us to make some hard decisions and I'm ready to make those hard decisions for the city. My background is one of business management. I'm able to bring people, events, and programs together to successfully complete a successful completion. I think I can you know, benefit the city by taking those skills, talents, and proven experience I have and bringing people together. And I know that all these people are doing a great job, want to do the best, but I just feel like I can pull it all together with this experience. Being a 36-year resident, I know where we've been, I know where we're currently going, and I know where we need to go. And being a mom of three boys, that should probably sum up a lot of what you're asking, Casey, and, and what I, and the experience that I have is there's a lot that comes with being a mom and a wife and a resident and a patron of the city. And that experience that I have, it's going to carry me through, I hopefully for the next four years, that passion that I have as well for the city. And so basically what I'm saying is, that I want to be able to continue to serve and bring my passion forward and use the experience of I've, I've had growing up here in Pleasantville and living here. Um, I think my business experience and accounting background uh, deal with different businesses, different departments on a daily basis, uh, helping them understand their budget and how to control their costs and to make their business more effective. Uh, I think Applying these tried and true business practices is uh, a very logical solution that uh, every city should apply on a 
a monthly and an, an annual basis. I'm a senior project manager for a, a large uh, steel fabricator. We do large steel buildings and bridges across 11 states. Um, with that capacity, I have to deal with the legal contracts. We manage multi-million dollar budgets. I have to work with several different government agencies and, and get the red tape involved with those. And really what it comes down to is that my professional and my educational background and experiences are what I think are going to bring the most to the city council. Um, I'm a self-employed in uh, California, so I have that experience. I also have, um, like I said, volunteered a lot in the community. And part of that volunteering is raising money for schools, um, organizing <coughs> programs, balancing budgets, um, taking care of financials at, a, at the PCA and any school. Um, school community council, I've, I've been president at the school community council, I've been president of the PCA, and all of that requires you know, working with the public and organizing, working with parents and dealing with issues and problems. First and foremost, seeing a mother of 10 children and also homeschooling them. I feel I've learned to study things out, to research, to look at difference of opinions, to meet the needs of not just one child or two or three, but 10 of them, and learn to also um, to um, be able to they're not, they, they won't all agree on the same thing, so I've learned to compromise and learned to look at what is the best for all of us. I've had the opportunity to run several sizable jobs, uh, big jobs throughout the western United States. Tunnels under the continental divide, uh, power plants, freeways, all kinds of infrastructure. And I've handled the estimates, the budgeting, and the actual building of those projects. Uh, sometimes at one time, uh, I would say peak of manpower under my supervision was probably around 500. Uh, I can handle what the city's got. Okay, our next question. This will be um, this will be a one-minute answer. Um, what does it mean to you to have an open and transparent public? Um, what, and what is your philosophy on government transparency? Let's go ahead and start right here. And candidates, you might want to say your name at the beginning of each question just to help remind the audience to come. Might help us remember who we are. Too. There you go. <laughs> um, well, I'm Don Paz. Just when I thought I was going to be comfortable in answering questions, he throws that one. Transparency to me is, um, is you know, I just told my wife the other day, I have trouble with that word. Anytime a, a person running for political office says, I want to be completely transparent, it throws a red flag up. The transparency to me is involving the citizens and not worrying about them seeing anything I do. I, you know, I want to have open meetings always, I want to talk to people openly, and I want to be honest with it. Will I take some flag for it? Possibly. But I'm willing to do that because I think the citizens are the most important part of any organization. And I believe that the citizens of this country um, are the most are the ones that employ us as politicians. By the way, uh, it'll be my first year being a politician. Maybe I'll learn differently. Being open transparent and transparent is key to being on the city council. I help manage a Facebook page. This is called the Pleasant Grove Community Connection. We have over 4,300 members on that page. Every Tuesday, I start a forum that's called Let's Talk Tuesday. And that's why I invite the residents to come on that page and ask me any questions. And I will do my best to find that answer. That's my job as a council member, to be open, transparent, listen, put it all out there. This is your money. This is your community. And I need to hear from you in order to do my job. I can't make decisions on your behalf for you and your family unless I hear from you and I get that feedback. So coming to city council meeting, I love it when people stand up. They're passionate. That's what I appreciate. I love to hear from you through email, through text messaging, through phone calls. I'm on the clock 24-7 while I'm city council member. And sometimes that can get a little worrying for my family, but that's okay, that's what I signed up for. And they know that I get those late night phone calls, they know that I'm on, on uh, social media trying to solve problems. That is my job, to make sure that I am transparent, open, and just here for you as a council member to listen to your needs. That's how I make my decisions on behalf of you and your family. I'm Blake Thatcher. Um, open and transparent meeting, uh, I think obviously, has to present 
all of the information, both sides of the information, not just one perspective or what we would like to have happen or what agenda we're trying to push. So I think to actually be open and transparent, we have to actually present data, real verifiable information, and be willing to entertain a discussion on both sides. So uh, this is one of the concerns I've had with, with some of our process as I've been attending council meetings, uh, is that we appear to be a little afraid to look at all of the data uh, when we make decisions. And so uh, to be transparent, you really have to be willing to look at all of the information. Matt Godsey, um, the word open to me kind of means you need to be able to listen to all sides, willing to compromise, listen to the, the issues at hand. Um, for transparency, it, it kind of just speaks to no hidden agenda, not having a, a different reason for, for doing what you're doing. Being accountable to the citizen. Sticking to your core values rather than coming to pressure or others' ideals. If you don't have enough information, you need to have the courage to be able to wait and say, hey, I want you to go back and give me more information so I can educate the citizen. These are the things that I think are important to being open and transparent. actually gone in and with our meetings there was times when we would have parts of the meetings that um, weren't there were discussions but they didn't have public um, options of public meetings. and I went in and requested that those were opened up because the city was making several um, very important decisions and having some major discussions with no input from our community so I went in and asked them to open it up and they, and they, um, they did do that to a certain extent um, as far as transparency goes, one of the biggest trouble is trying to find the information. And we have the city website, which is a little complicated and hard to deal with. And I have um, done a lot of work with um, our the secretary to try to make sure that the meeting minutes are up when they're supposed to, the audio is up when it's supposed to, because sometimes it gets it neglected and it doesn't get posted on time. So I've done a lot of work you know, trying to get more open um, meetings and open transparency. But um, in the past, my husband has accused me of being a little too transparent, and I, it was because I was just open and honest. What you see is what you get. I have nothing to hide in my life and in what I do. I believe that in all that we do, things need to be that way on the city level, on the government level. The PTA and the school, um, school community council. I, I've been president of the school community council. I've been president of the PTA. And all that requires, you know, working with the public and organizing, working with parents and dealing with issues and problems. First and foremost, seeing a mother of ten children, and also homeschooling them, I feel I've learned to study things out, to research, to look at difference of opinions, to meet the needs of not just one child or two or three, but ten of them, and learn to also. Um, to um, be able to, they're not, they, they won't all agree on the same thing, so I've learned to compromise and learned to look at what is the best for all of us. I've had the opportunity to run several sizable jobs, uh, big jobs throughout the western United States, tunnels under the continental divide, uh, power plants, freeways, all kinds of infrastructure, and I've handled the estimates, the budgeting, and the actual building of those projects. Uh, sometimes at one time, uh, I would say peak of manpower under deep flight supervision was probably around 500. Uh, I can handle what the city's got. Okay, our next question. This will be, um, this will be a one minute answer. Um, what does it mean to you to have an open and transparent public meeting? Um, what, and what is your philosophy on government transparency? Let's go ahead and start right here. And candidates, you might want to say your name at the beginning of each question just to help remind the audience your names. Okay. Uh, 
might help us remember who we are. Too. There you go. <laughs> um, well, I'm Don Paz. Just when I thought I was going to be comfortable in answering questions, he throws that one. Transparency to me is, um, is you know, I just told my wife the other day, I have trouble with that word. Anytime a, a person running for political office says, I want to be completely transparent, it throws a red flag up. The transparency to me is involving the citizens and not worrying about them seeing anything I do. I, you know, I want to have open meetings always. I want to talk to people openly, and I want to be honest with it. Will I take some flag for it? Possibly, but I'm willing to do that because I think the citizens are the most important part of any organization, and I believe that the citizens of this country um, are the most are the ones that employ us as politicians. By the way. It'll be my first year being a politician. Maybe I'll learn differently. Being open and transparent is key to being on the city council. I help manage a Facebook page. This is called the Pleasant Grove Community Connection. We have over 4,300 members on that page. Every Tuesday, I start a forum that's called Let's Talk Tuesday. And that's why I invite the residents to come on that page and ask me any questions. And I will do my best to find that answer. That's my job as a council member, to be open, transparent, listen, Put it all out there, this is your money, this is your community, and I need to hear from you in order to do my job. I can't make decisions on your behalf for you and your family unless I hear from you and I get that feedback. So coming to city council meeting, I love it when people stand up. They're passionate. That's what I appreciate. I love to hear from you through email, through text messaging, through phone calls. I'm on the clock 24-7 while I'm a city council member, and sometimes that can get a little worrying for my family, but that's okay, that's what I signed up for. And they know that I get those late night phone calls, they know that I'm on on uh, social media trying to solve problems. That is my job, to make sure that I am transparent, open, and just here for you as a council member to listen to your needs. That's how I make my decisions on behalf of you and your family. I'm Blake Thatcher. Um, open and transparent meeting, uh, I think obviously has to present all of the information, both sides of the information not just one perspective or what we would like to have happen or what agenda we're trying to push. So I think to actually be open and transparent, you have to actually present data, real verifiable information, and be willing to entertain a discussion on both sides. So uh, this is one of the concerns I've had with, with some of our process as I've been attending council meetings, uh, that we appear to be a little afraid to look at all of the data uh, when we make decisions. And so, uh, to be transparent, you really have to be willing to look at all of the information. Matt Godsey. Um, the word open, to me, kind of means you need to be able to listen to all sides, willing to compromise, listen to the, the issues at hand. Um, for transparency, it, it kind of speaks to no hidden agenda, not having a, a different reason for, for doing what you're doing. Being accountable to the citizen. Sticking to your core values rather than coming to pressure or others' ideals. If you don't have enough information, you need to have the courage to be able to wait and say, hey, I want you to go back and give me more information so that I can educate the citizen. These are the things that I think are really important to being open and transparent. Jill, but um, in the past, my husband has accused me of being a little too transparent. 
And I, it was because I was just open and honest. What you see is what you get. I have nothing to hide in my life and in what I do. I believe that on all that we do, things need to be that way. On the city level, on the government level, we need to be able to get the information that we are all desiring. We need to have it up front before laws are passed or in, on the city council before changes are made. Open and transparent meetings are just that. Uh, and it seems to me that that's the way the meetings are turning out right now in the present world. Under the guidance of the mayor, where everything's discussed, it's thoroughly read, and, and we look for what the majority opinion is and to go with it. And that's what it is for me. I wrote down a couple words um, on open viewpoints and perspectives. Are we being open to all of, all of us, all our citizens? Are we listening to them and understanding where they're coming from? We, may, we all have different perspectives and viewpoints of where our citizens are coming from. We have to be open to that. And we have to understand where they're coming from. And so, in being open, I want to listen to all of you. I'm trying to knock on as many doors as I can, I'm trying to listen to what we deem is necessary in our community. Uh, transparent is one thing I like about what our city is doing is being open and transparent. Uh, anytime you have any kind of questions, when I was, before I was on city council a few months ago, anytime I had a question, I knew I could go to either Scott or Dean Lindell, our finance director, and their door is always open. And they're always understanding what we want and where we're coming from. Dean is always welcoming and, and wants to sit down and discuss the budget with you. And that's a, a good thing I like about our city. Okay, um, we're going to take just a second and pass some water bottles down the row because I noticed that most of you didn't have water and air gas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's really good water. It's been kept warm in my trunk. Um, <laughs> Above room temperature. <laughs> All right. It could have been hotter today. I mean, the dust storm kept things cool. Um, we're going to go ahead and do a proper role of government question. So this is going to be kind of broad. Um, but what do you? What is the proper role of the city government, and what role do you play in that government as a city council member? Let's go ahead and start with Sid and then head down the row. And let's go ahead and have uh, 90 seconds for this one. The great thing about local elections and local government is that you can play a huge part in the proper role of government within your own city. And we need to be listening to you, what you want as a citizen. You want to cut services? Come present that to the city council. We'll take a look at that. If you don't want to cut services and you want to enjoy amenities that you and your family have a quality of life here from those amenities, come and let us know. There are many ways that you can control that proper role of government here within your own community. And I do believe there are essential roles and non-essential roles. And those essential roles of government are something that, that I take very seriously as a council member. I will say that essential to me includes our amenities such as the library, the pool, the rec center, things that we enjoy to make our quality of life better here in Pleasant Grove. Essential services also include our fire, police, infrastructure, roads, utilities. It encompasses all of that. It's not just one or the other, it's everything that makes us a community. And I'm not in favor of doing away with one or the other. I'm in favor of improving our utilities, improving our infrastructure, improving our local programs that our youth, that our children and grandchildren enjoy. I'm in favor of all of that. It's not about cutting, it's about improving, bringing in more sales tax, and learning how we can do a better job of balancing our budget and making sure that we provide the quality of life that you and your family here can enjoy. So the proper role of government, it's going to be different for each one of you. It's going to be different in the view of each of the ladies council members. But I can tell you that's where I stand, is to continue to improve that proper role of government here in Pleasant, excuse me, in Pleasant, I'm not getting choked up, here in Pleasant Grove, based on what you tell me as a resident. Uh, Lynn Thatcher, um, this is a deep question. The proper role of government uh, really encompasses a lot, and I think we've got to be really willing to look at the depth of that question beyond just what is the priority of services. 
uh, certainly there is a natural priority of services for which the city was organized. And uh, you know, those are core functions that the city needs to be able to perform. But the other aspect to this, this question, I think, is what role does our local city government actually play in your life beyond the provision of certain key services like roads or water or police and fire protection? How intrusive is your city government in your life? And how much decision-making authority does it have over <coughs> you and the things that you can and can't do? And so I think this is a very, very significant question. Uh, a council member and all of the administrators swear to an oath uh, to uphold the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of this state, and to fulfill their duty with fidelity. And that duty is to represent you, the citizens. And I think it's absolutely vital that that be paramount and that we not overlook the real role in our citizens' lives. The proper role of government, in part, has a lot to do with the mayor. He's the CEO, or the executive branch of the, of the city. Um, it's his job to manage the staff, to direct, and to listen to the citizens and promote the city for several different reasons. The staff should be following the direction of the mayor and the city council, provide information that's requested of them, and provide the essential services as well as non-essential services. City council is a legislative body. And they should prioritize essential services above everything else within the budget, and then provide the best level of service for the non-essential services within budgetary limits. The citizens' responsibility, I think, is the most important one out of all of us. The citizens need to let the city council, the mayor, and the staff know what they want for their city, what level of service they want for their uh, non for the essential services like the fire and the police and then move on to the non-essential services and let them know how much of those they want. That really comes back down to your taxes. So how much tax are you willing to pay to keep the level of service for your essential services and then what non-essential services are you willing to pay for? Yeah, for that, Lisa. The proper role of government for me is um, what is defined as um, essential needs of our city, which is the health, safety, and welfare of our community. And it also needs to be distributed equally among citizens and it shouldn't be favoring one over the other. So um, that's that's where the proper goal of government goes. We, we do swear to, you know, uh, we take an oath to um, uphold the Utah and the United States Constitution and that um, is also defined the proper goal of government in the Constitution which I uh, support on whole part of Thank you. Jill Bett. The proper, for me, the proper role of government is that we follow that pursuit of the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But we do not try to give something that is not our right to give. We need to make sure we are, we stay within those bounds. What, is it our right as a city to make decisions that will impact other people's lives that don't fall within the infrastructure and our roads and some things. I, I love our parks. Um, I don't necessarily know if I, if that really would fall under what I believe to be the proper role of government. So that we must stay within our budget if we, if it doesn't fit and we have to relook things. And that we need to stick to what falls within the life, liberty, and our property. I think we uh, often make some of these things way too complicated. I think you talk to the public, find out what level of service they want, you turn around and tell them how much that level of service is going to cost, they tell you back if they want it sent back. And that's what you're providing. You're providing essential services, which you're actually required to provide by law in some of these cases, the utilities, for instance. And you, you pass and keep those going and make sure that, that everything is in good shape that way. But it's that simple. Pick your level of service, decide what it's going to cost, you decide what, how much of it you want, and go forward. Let's uh, keep the pleasant and pleasant going. 
Eric Jensen, I was talking to my wife, I'm not saying my name enough, so here we go. Proper role of government. Uh, I look at the core of our city, infrastructures, pipes and the unique, uh, the utilities, public safety, fire, police. Are we offering that? Are we providing the level of service that the citizens expect and need? And also along with that comes what the citizens want. And that comes down to, we voted a few years ago for a rec center, for a pool, a library. Are we providing that level of service to our citizens? Is that what they want? I say it is, is what they want. Now, some may have a different definition of proper role of government. But I say the proper role of government, are we listening to the citizens of Pleasant Grove and what, is, what makes our community great? It is all of the above. Thank you. Don Paz. Um, proper role of government to me is minimal government. Uh, some of the things that I think uh, a person has responsibilities to when elected to a an office is to minimize the spending that's given to them, to stay within the budgets allotted, and especially to not go out and increase budgets without going to the people and asking them. And as Lynn had said, oh, I didn't use the third second. As Lynn had said in there, when you, when you go in there and, um, and go out to the people and ask them what they want, then go back and let them know what that'll cost to make that decision. I trust the people. I think there's more things that people can do in our city. I am so excited. When we did the Discovery Park thing as, as, a, as a group, that brought us together. That was exciting. I think that those type things ought to be trusted and given to the people to do, maybe encouraged at our level. The most important thing, I think, though, is that a city councilman has been elected to represent the people, to direct the staff of this city how to spend the budget and meet these different services and stuff that, are respons that they're responsible for, including doing the roads and some of the other amenities that we enjoy. Thank you. I know there's a lot of excitement to talk about roads. Um, we'll get, we will get there. Most of you have mentioned it at some point. The second half of the debate will focus on roads and, and a lot of the, the hot button issues here in Pleasant Grove. Um, let's uh, go to a. Uh, oh, wait, actually, Lynn, you did get mentioned. Do you want? Do you want 30 seconds? No. You totally can. Yeah. All right. You just scored points with a lot of people out there. Right okay. All right. What is your politician who keeps their mouth shut. Um, <laughs> all right, what is your philosophy on our current tax policies, and would you be willing to raise taxes? Um, let's go ahead and start with Blaine. Uh, let's do a one-minute answer on this one. Okay. Um, my philosophy on taxes is not to raise them. Uh, I believe that we can provide well the services we have and want in Pleasant Grove without raising taxes. We just need to manage and allocate it properly. Um, I think we have to be very, very careful when it comes to taxes. Taxes are essentially taken by force from the people. Uh, I imagine there are some who willingly uh, pay them, uh, but essentially we force people to turn over their taxes. And so I think we have to be extremely careful on how we levy taxes and what we levy them for. Um, we have to be justified in what we do, and it has to certainly be within the proper role of government and within the core level of services, I think. Matt Godsey. Um, my belief that the utilities that we have in Pleasant Grove are a high burden. So we are much higher than the majority of others around us. The property taxes that we have are kind of on par. So overall, we are one of the most taxed cities in the area. Um, I really think that as far as that goes, we should live within our means. We need to work within the budget that we've been given. It doesn't mean that we need to raise taxes for anything else. I think it is essential that we as a city will only ask the citizens to raise the taxes after we've done everything that we can possibly do within our current budget. If we are not fiscally responsible and prioritizing our spending in the right departments to provide those essential services, I think we are doing a disservice as a city to every single citizen. 
So if we do not prioritize the budget properly and do everything we can with the dollars that we do have, I see no reason to raise taxes until we have done that first. Jennifer Batista, um, my feeling for taxes is we are taxed a whole lot, um, not only in our current city, but in our state and our county. And they are going up like crazy. We have several new taxes coming to us next year. Um, we have a uh, tax that may be coming on our ballot in November. Um, we, I am not in favor of raising taxes. I, I think that we tend to lean on taxes way too much. Um, I think that there should be other ways for us to be looking at financially supporting our city. And that can come in all sorts of variations. And it would take a lot of um, support and discussions from our citizens to get involved and decide what our priorities are and how to fund those priorities and if we're willing to pay for those priorities. I don't know that taxes are necessarily the reason or the way that we should do that. I think that we have other options to look at first. And you know, and we need to look inside our own budget Excuse me, Jennifer. Just quick follow up on that. So, what would be the way? What What are the alternative ways? What are a couple of the specifics? Well, one, I, I think that we need to have a, a, a deep discussion and looking into our own budget and seeing where we can um, find some savings and, and and see what's possible. What what are possibilities there in you know making our making our our budget more efficient. Um, other things is we can look at universities instead of um, taxes because taxes are coming out of one pocket and universities are coming out of another pocket. And sometimes you're getting both and you don't even know that you're paying both. So um, I think we should be able to actually open and transparent. I think that we need to be more open and transparent about what money we're spending and how much it's costing and which pocket it's coming from. Is it coming from taxes? Is it coming from fees? Is it, you know, what, what is it? And what are you willing to pay? I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, just my taxes. It's, it's, it's everybody's taxes and it's everybody's money. And, and everybody should have a say in how their money is being spent. And they should be aware and educated on where their money is coming from as of now, because most people don't know how much they're actually paying okay. between the taxes. And the taxes. Okay, thank you so much. I just needed a little bit of clarity on that one. Thanks. Do you that? Um, I think she just summed up a whole lot of what I was going to talk about. We are taxed as, I think was her name. She said, <laughs> um, and I, I believe that although I will, don't want to see our utilities and different things go up, I would rather it be we have our user fees go up and not be taxed on both sides. Um, in one city that we lived in, there was a lot of volunteer service. I'd like to see more volunteer service so we can cut back on a lot of expenses. We, we would, um, they would put plants and different things out on Main Street and as citizens of the, of the city, we would go and plant and take care of the flower beds all along Main Street and I loved that. I love being able to get involved in those different ways. I don't believe in raising taxes. We need to do all that we can to avoid that. Uh, we, the public, each one of us here, is fully aware that we pay all we can. Whether it's taxes, whether it's fees, whatever it may be, comes out of our pocket. We need to be careful with that. But my opinion is very simply that you have fees, a transportation fee, or whatever it may be, and pay as you go, rather than tax. But there are occasions when you better look to tax, too. If you're going to have it, you've got to pay for it. Eric Jensen. Uh, the simple politician answer would be no new taxes, right? We hear that all the time. But we have to look at our budget. Our budget is tight. It's streamlined and it's balanced right, right now. A lot of the departments in our city haven't had an increase in their, in their budget for many, many years. And so we have to look at the level of service we're willing to provide. We have to listen to you as citizens because it's going to come before you as citizens as a vote if we're going to do a property tax or any other taxes, any increase in land price funds, water, sewer, storm drain. It always comes down to the citizens and the choice that you have to make. Are we providing the level of service needed to 
to repair a lot of the, the services that we have. We have a lot of aging infrastructure in Pleasant Grove. Answers have to be found somewhere, and I believe the budget is tight right now. And are we willing to lose certain levels of service in the city for that? Okay. John Paz. I'm starting to get to know me. Uh, <laughs> so my position on uh, the current tax policy is I think there's some loopholes in the tax policy systems of our country. One is if you can push different kind of taxes on the people without them knowing it until all of a sudden it shows up. So as far as the tax policy, I think there's improvements, a lot of them. Um, if you narrow it down to our city and say, are, am I willing to raise taxes there? I would do everything in my power to find the most, the, the ways to make us the leanest, most effective. I'd apply lean management in every area. And I would look at any efficiencies we could find before we even came to the people for additional tax. Um, your dollars are sacred to me. You know, as mine are sacred to me. I, I've been in city council where I've seen some people, I get 50 seconds, get see people come in and $7 is a killer. They may lose a home. My heart breaks and then to hear them go out and be told to go seek welfare to help make their utility payments breaks my heart. I don't ever want to be a part of that. Thank you. So just to, to clarify a couple a couple statements, we're actually below average for our property tax. We have not had a property tax increase here in Pleasant Grove in over 30 years. And that was a little bit part of the problem as to why we haven't been able to fund some of our infrastructure needs. Also, I want to talk about sales tax because that's what we need to increase. We don't need to cut the quality of services here we enjoy in Pleasant Grove. We can definitely find inefficiencies in, in any department that we have here in the city but we don't need to cut. Anytime you raise fees, any kind, or whether we're talking user fees or taxes, it's still coming out of the same pocket, and that's your pocket, and that's my pocket. And so the sales tax increase is where we need to focus our time and energy. We need businesses to come here into the city, then it ends up being a win-win for the citizen and the city. It gives us a place to shop, eat, for entertainment, and it also brings money back into the city to repair infrastructure, improve our roads, utilities, and put money back into our pocketbook. And that's what I believe in, is if we need a tax increase, then that will go to the vote of the people. But I'm not going to lie to you and say, as a politician per se, that I would never do a tax increase. That would have to be your choice. Um, on tax policy, because I did give one of the candidates a little bit of extra time, does anyone else want another couple seconds to elaborate? Are we good? Okay. All right. Um, do you favor, this is going to be just a, a quick 30 second one, but this is from one of the questions I received, so I want to make sure I understand it. I rephrased the question. Um, do you favor eliminating public funding of the uh, city library or rec center? Um, let's go ahead and start with Matt. Matt Godsey, simple answer is no. Um, why would we eliminate any of the wonderful services that we have here in Pleasant Grove? Let's keep them. Let's manage the, each of the one, one of those services better so they can work towards self-sufficiency. Rec Center is still kind of new. We've been doing better and better every year, and we're subsidizing it less and less. That shows that we're on a sustainable path where we can move forward. So let's just follow that path and make sure that those services that we do have fall within the budgetary means that they have. Yes, Baptista. Answer is no. We subsidize both of these facilities, and I I want to look into seeing if we can make them revenue neutral. But no, I don't. I'm not doing that. Just to restate the question, do you favor eliminating public funding of the city library or rec center? Public funding? Yeah. yeah. No, so that then. Uh, do you favor eliminating public so so tax dollars going towards uh, keeping those flow? Uh, yeah, I, no, it wasn't for you, Jennifer. Sorry, I, she asked me. She called me over and asked me to restate the question, so I just wanted to make sure. Jill, uh, I asked for that too. Um, no, I am grateful for our libraries. I I love having libraries, and we we need to have to have them. No. Okay. <laughs> No. All right. The answer is no way. Um, the, the, the library services about 623 programs. It hits about 24,000 children in our community. The REC, over 30 programs, 
that serves over 15,000 kids, plus the attendees that come to watch those games. What a great thing these, these two ways to make of our community. Um, my wife works there as a storyteller at the library, so I'm a little biased baby. But I see that the, the direction it's taken with these kids and the, and the help that it helps. You know, the good things it does to the kids. So. Don Paz, definitely not. But let me clarify. I would do everything I could to get uh, a program going where we try to get more people to come to our rec center and therefore, we wouldn't have to subsidize it. And so I, I like that. I've been by the public library, been watching that ever since I've been accused that I'm going to do something I didn't know I was going to do. And, and I look at the number of cars there. There's a lot of people that use our library. Absolutely not. I grew up participating in these programs, and they're vital to our community. And I am not in favor of eliminating the school, library, rec center, any, any amenity that our city would agree that this is, this is something that's essential to our community, so absolutely not. Blaine Thatcher, uh, the answer is no. I would not uh, favor eliminating public funding for these types of services. As I've stated before here and in many other occasions, I believe uh, we have enough revenue to provide the services we're currently providing uh, without raising taxes. So. We, we don't need to eliminate public funding for these services. Okay. The original question just said something to the effect of, I've heard that several candidates would like to eliminate public funding for the library and rec center. And my understanding from all those answers is that no candidates want that. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Um, continuing on. Um, by the way, I, 10 to 15 percent of the citizens of Pleasant Grove will be turning out to vote in this upcoming election. Um, that's it. It's amazing how many people care uh, about where their tax dollars are spent and how high their tax dollars are going to be. So those of you in this room, I, I definitely really appreciate your participation and, and your research on this. Just so you know, your state senator, Al Jackson, uh, won his race by one vote. So it does matter. Uh, your vote does count. Um, so please uh, make sure that your friends and neighbors know your position on the candidates tonight and get the word out. Um, we've got one more hour left. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, move in a little bit of a different direction right after, uh, right after this one. Um, I've been focusing a lot on philosophy as much as we can because one of the reasons is if we just did rapid fire of specific policy questions all night, um, we would at most get your positions on maybe 10 or 15 issues. And the philosophy questions hopefully are a way for us to know how you would vote on any number of dozens or hundreds of issues over the course of your four-year term. Um, I'm going to get into a specific in just a second, but this is the final kind of philosophy question I'd like to ask. Um, who is someone on the national political stage um, that you identify with politically. And just, I know this is hard, but some people don't want to okay, say it. Is it fictional or non fictional? Uh, is, it, is it Donald Trump or not Donald Trump? No, I'm, just no, I'm just kidding. I like Donald Trump. Um, okay, go ahead. And uh, it, it is somebody that is real. Um, it, would, it would be good if it was someone that we all know. And they should be contemporary, not dead. So, um, let's go ahead and begin. This is not a fluff question, believe it or not. If I'm in the audience, this is probably the one I want to know the most, just because it helps me know where you're at. Um, so, Jennifer, we're going to go ahead and begin one more time. Who is someone on the national political stage that you identify politically with? Uh, you have 30 seconds. This doesn't need to be a long one. Yeah, oh wait, clarification, yeah. Does that have to be somebody that's living or somebody uh, living. that know, let them know how uh, If it's someone that we all know, go ahead. But if all of you say Ronald Reagan, I'm going to be disappointed. So, <laughs> I love Ronald Reagan. Oh my goodness, I love him. I just, but any Republican debate I've ever moderated, everybody says Reagan. So, all right, Jennifer. I prefer not living. Okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> You can say why, too, if you guys want to. Well, because he, he was one of the signers in, um, and, um, 
creators of the Constitution. Um, living, I would say, uh, Rand Paul. He's a great constitutionalist, and I love who he is and what he stands for. Lynn Walker, I'm not too excited about any of your campaign team has you prepped. Okay. <laughs> for a second, George Washington, because he got the job done, and if I had to look at anyone out there just right now, it would be uh, Governor Walker, because he, he tells it how it is. Don Paz, um, I have to say Will Rogers, some of you will know who he is. <laughs> I never met a person I didn't like. <laughs> I would say any woman in politics I, I admire. It's definitely a man's world, and any time I think a woman can step up and be involved in local politics or on a national level, I really respect that. I would say though, Leslie Nope from Parks and Rec, the TV show. <laughs> After about a dozen people came up and said, you remind me of Leslie Nope, I thought I better start watching this to either be a, a compliment or they could be bashing me, I wasn't sure. Um, I'm in season six, and I, I absolutely love that show and what she did for her community and the passion that she had. So I wish she was a real person. I'd be on a road trip to go eat pancakes with her at the Waffle House. <laughs> are there any city staff that are like her? No comment. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lynn Pennington, Lynn Pennington, Lynn Thatcher, I guess uh, living, I would have to say uh, Mike Lee, I probably identify with. Uh, Ryan Green, I don't think we can consider him on the national stage yet, so I can't list him. But uh, non-living, uh, there are several of the founding fathers that I identify with very closely and uh, think very, very highly of. John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, to name just a few. Matt Godsey. Um, historically, I think Benjamin Franklin was very analytical and scientific in, in the way he approached things. Um, more recently, Gino Rossi, who ran for governor of Washington, um, but the core values and, and the fiscal responsibility that he was trying to make the change in Washington was very important to me. Sounds good. Okay, well, thank you for those answers. Um, I never know how seriously candidates are going to take that one. I'd really like to know, though. Um, speaking of your answer, Sid, that was funny. Uh, this really was my next question. Um, <laughs> I almost don't want to ask it now. Um, all right. What is your opinion of our current city staff, and are you concerned about any departments specifically? Um, let's go ahead and start at the end. A jump. So one more time. What is your opinion of the current city staff, and are you concerned about any departments specifically or department heads? Uh, 30 seconds. I just started getting involved with this um, when, when I decided to run for city council, so quite frankly, I am not very familiar with the city staff. Uh, having been involved with the city staff for the last 12, 13 years, I can tell you from my experience that you have some of the strongest, best trained, outstanding staff members that, that I have seen in in my experience of 50 years. You guys are faster, they're better, they're more loyal, they're donating to you time, they're giving you everything. I have no worries about the city staff. With my experience the last uh, five, six years on the Downtown Advisory Board Planning Commission, Planning Commission Chair, and now the last few months on the City uh, Council, I've watched our dedicated employees work their tail off. Um, do I have a concern with any of them? No because they're working as hard as they can for the city to make it a great community. Now, are there always areas of improvement? Yes. But we can work, we can work with that to the citizens and any concerns we can have. Thank you. Are we done saying our name each time? It's as much as you want to say it. It's like, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, my opinion of the current city staff is they're great people. Uh, as I mentioned, and I won't say whose name mentioned them because that gives me more time. Um, they, they really do give you all the personal attention you need. What I have a concern, probably the only concern, is the uh, city councilmen make 
our direction to them clear and succinct on what we expect for them to do. I absolutely support our city staff 100%. I know them personally and professionally from getting to them over the past four years. If I do have a concern, because it's going to happen, there's going to be times when I hear from the public and I need to address a department head about a concern going on, I call them up, I text them, I go by their, their department. I don't have an issue doing that at all. I need to be open and transparent as much with the city staff as I am with the public. And I support them in everything that they do. If, as I said, is there going to be questions and concerns? Yes, but I will address those with the council member. And if you ever have problems or concerns with what's going on in the departments, you just let us know. Um, I think very highly of all of our city staff. I have worked with a few of them. I spent some time with our finance director as I got more involved in financial statements. Uh, and I, I think they do a very, very good job. Uh, I'm not concerned about any individuals, uh, but I am concerned about every budget. And I think to solve the spending problems that we have, we need to be willing to scrutinize every budget and look very carefully at the level of spending. Uh, and that does not impugn any individual. That is a business practice that has to happen. I think we have some excellent staff. Um, they're award-winning and they're respected and sought after from other departments. I went to the Pleasant Grove Citizens Academy for the police and I found it very enlightening to know that there's several other departments that actually look to them as, as a leader. I don't have any specific concerns with the department head or a specific department person. And I think we can only measure them from their success from the direction that they are given by the, the mayor and city council. Um, I have worked with a lot of our staff and um, their employees, and they've always been very open in, in giving me plenty of information in their time. So I don't have any problems with um, the way that they uh, conduct themselves. Um, I do have concern with the uh, Public Works Department, because I know that that budget is the lowest budget, and we have some major um, um, problems and, and issues that we need to deal with with our roads and everything. So I have a, I have a concern about the budget, but not... Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and try to decide how we want to do this on a format basis. Uh, this is, we're going to talk about the, the public safety bond, um, the first bond, the second bond, and a possible future bond. Um, originally, I wanted to keep this one pretty short, but because this was something that pretty much all the candidates discussed that I have had a chance to talk to and uh, throughout the audience as I chat with people. This is something people really want to know. I think what we're going to do is there's going to be basically one minute. You're all going to answer. I'm going to state the question. And then there's going to be a follow-up minute. Because you are going to have some disagreements on this. And I think that this will probably be one of the more animated questions. And it would be really important for us to understand the differences. Um, because this is a, a pretty critical issue, and I can see you know different public safety people walking in the building. So this is something a lot of people are going to be interested in. Um, so what was your position? Listen closely, because I'm not going to say it too many times. Um, what was your position on the original public safety bond, the most recent bond? So so the original public safety bond, the most recent bond, and what is your position on a bond for the public safety building in the future? Go ahead and describe each of those positions and elaborate on as to why as best you can. So the original bond, and you only have one minute, but there will be a follow-up round. So if you don't get everything you want, there will be another round. But I do want to, we want to make this a debate round. Okay, let's go ahead and start with Jill, and then we're going to work this way this time. So Jill followed by Jennifer. Yes, yeah, she didn't answer the last one, but we're going to start that way and then work this way again. So, so it'll be Jill followed by Jennifer followed by so on and so forth. Okay? Okay, one more time. What was your position on the original public safety bond, the most recent bond, and what is your position on a bond for the public safety building in the future? One minute. I um, was against the public safety bond primarily, both times actually, primarily because I felt that it was, they, they were asking for way too much money for uh, I think we can build something that fits more within our needs and what we have. Um, I was involved um, pretty extensively in all the bonding and, and the preparation process. 
And so I've been on committees and attended all the city meetings and everything. So um, I am all in favor of finding a solution for our public safety. But I was unable to um, vote for either bond. And it was, you know, truly the fact that there were so many citizens that hadn't gotten their answers um, addressed. And there were so many different things that wasn't, you know, being discussed that I felt that if, if you're going to vote for anything at that kind of level and that kind of extent, that every voter and every person that has to pay for this should have their answers answered before they cast that vote. And I had I had questions that I didn't get answers for. And it was, you know, as the, that is why I voted no. As far as a, a future bond, um, we're still in the process of going through and, and getting more information that wasn't given in the previous time. Matt Godsey. Um, I was actually in favor of the first bond because I was relatively new to Pleasant Grove and I didn't uh, do a whole lot of research on it. And I looked at it from an engineer's perspective where we do have buildings that, in my opinion, and from an ethics standpoint, are not adequate. And then from cost per square foot, it was kind of in line from my business experience where I think it's supposed to be. On the second bond, the cost per square foot went quite a bit higher and I got a whole lot more information and started looking into the fact that we had some really old studies and that information did not jive with my professional background and the retrofit studies that I've personally done on several different buildings. And to that end, um, I did vote against it and was want some more information. For future bonds, I, I'm not saying that I'm opposed to it or, or in favor of it. I do say that from a life safety standpoint, we need to make sure that we can provide from an ethical standpoint enough of the facility to make sure the people in Thailand are safe. Um, while I understand uh, the needs we have for a public safety building, um, I was not in favor of the first bond. I thought the price was exorbitant, and the fact that our city leaders were willing to impose a very, very significant tax increase upon us without our vote was extremely concerning to me. And, uh, really was distasteful. Uh, so I was not in favor of that bond. The second uh, bond proposal I was also not in favor of because I didn't think that we did adequate analysis. Uh, we only looked at one option and it happened to be a very expensive option. We also uh, engaged uh, and relied on the information from a source that really wasn't independent. They wanted to manage the project and so I couldn't support that bond. Uh, a future bond I would have trouble with as well because I think there are lower cost solutions available. Actually, that's incorrect information about the third party source. They would, did not have a project management uh, at the table to, to manage that project. The first bond, the first go around, first of all, I want to apologize because as a city, we did not do it right the first time. And so I want to apologize to the council member. The second time we came back, we listened to your concerns. We did much more research and data. We had numerous public hearings. We got you involved much more than we should have the first time. The first time that it happened, that was the first time in our history of our city that we wanted to build a public safety facility. That was the first time. So we did make some mistakes, and I'm willing to admit that. The second time, we came back, as I said, and took your input and your feedback and came back with a much better plan. We cut the square footage. We came back and we, we reduced the cost. Now, the square footage is much different than that on a home. And you can analyze the buildings in our area, in Salt Lake and Utah County, and you'll see that they were in line with the other public safety buildings in our area. I am in favor of finding a solution for our first responders. Just because it got voted down twice does not mean that this need has gone away. And my commitment to you as a council member is that we will find a solution, whether that's remodel, build new, change locations, we will find a solution because our first responders and you as a community deserve that to make sure our infrastructure is safe for you and your family. You may get in trouble on this one. Um, first, clarification. The very first thing that came up, as I mentioned earlier, was the Municipal uh, Building Authority Bond, an NBA. That was the $19 million one in August of 2013. I, like many of us, were, was not in favor of it, a favor of it because of the way it came to us. It was mandated to us, and we didn't do that. So I spoke up with many others about that. Then they took that same bond and they moved it over. So maybe these two kind of run together in our explanation and it became a, a, a general obligation bond. That was the one that was put forth for 
1.69 million in November 2013 that we voted down and I voted against that one. Then I was called to sit on the Citizens Committee and, um, and we put together the next bond um, and that was for 12 million seven. I really believe that that fire department is dilapidated and needs to be replaced. Um, I voted for that, but it's okay. My wife voted against it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that I wasn't choking on what you said. I just was taking some water, so I'm sorry, Don. <laughs> you said something like Do I get another minute? The longer it sits, the more expensive it gets. And we need to take a look at that very, very carefully. Uh, my position on the on it was yes, I was in favor the first time, yes, I was in favor the second time. And I think this third time we need to hear from our committee and see what's uh, going on and what ideas they've been able to come up with. And we can expect there's going to be a lot of trouble putting this committee together and we should be able to expect some good uh, thoughts on, on where we want to go. I remember every day that that fit. We're losing money. Okay, we're going to go to uh, Jennifer, then Matt, and Blaine on this one. Um, so, so this is only going to be a 30 second part. Um, why do you think it didn't pass both times? Like, what's the reason? You took another minute that you talked about. You will. You'll, well, you'll get it. You'll get 30 seconds here and then 30 seconds in a minute on another part of it. So, yeah. why do you think it didn't pass? Because I think this speaks to an issue here in Pleasant Grove on messaging and things like that. So, I believe it didn't pass one for the price and two because most of the citizens didn't think that they were being hurt. Um, cost per square foot for a uh, residential home is between 110 to 130 dollars for grand deal. If you double that, which is what you do for engineering house, and for the square foot cost book, it's about $260 for a public safety building. That is the average of where it should be from my professional experience. Um, and then also, I think that the information was not there. We did not have adequate information to be able to make a reasonable decision because of the large scale, with the large scale decision like this. The study that was done was from an engineering study done in 2001 based on the 1997 code. Really I think it, uh, both of them didn't pass because they were too expensive, and I think it was too high priced a solution to meet the needs that uh, were there. Um, I think the citizens also felt that they were being lobbied uh, and didn't have all of the information they really needed. Uh, we spent an entire year really telling us why we needed to vote for the second bond, and, and I think the citizens felt that. The process worked as it as it should have. We we heard from the residents, especially the first year, and we decided to change it to a geo bond based on uh, minimal feedback. And then when the feedback came, we decided to change it to a geo bond. Um, the reason it failed, I believe, is the first time was the fault of the city, and as I said, I'm going to take responsibility for that. The second time. I believe it was a lot of false information coming out from different sources in the city. I heard a resident tell me it was going to cost him $200 a month for the public safety building, and that was not true. There was a lot of false information. I heard rumors. I heard there were... <laughs> no, that's fine. I was just saying, yeah. I believe it failed because of the way it was handled and how it came down. Unilaterally to the people, I believe that uh, the second time it failed because people still had a bad taste. Can he talk in the mic? Oh. Did my time start over? No. <laughs> I believe the reason it failed the first time is the way it came down to the people. I believe the, uh, the second time it failed is because of the bad taste that was in people's mouths from that. Um, I believe the third time 
Um, well, if, if it was a third time, depends on how you count that, I think it was the, uh, it was still a bad take. So the first time, just to be, I think, to be honest, I think it was the cost for the citizens, the figure they saw, the information they received. Uh, the second time, I honestly, in my heart, still feel it was false information that, that got out there at the very last of that bond vote. And, and it comes down to information. We provide the right information, but we can't control the mud on the wall. I think that the, uh, the majority of the problem was the cost on the first one. And I think it was still cost uh, on the second one that everybody was scrutinizing so hard. I still draw that. Um, <laughs> I've been freezing up here. I definitely feel that it was the expense, that it was way more than we felt that we needed, and a lack of information and what was needed. Okay, um, we're going to start with Matt and go to Blaine on this one. Um, how high of a priority is it for you to get a solution on the fire station? And anything else you want to talk about, you can get 30 seconds to spend it how you wish. Um, it is extremely high for me. I think life safety is the most important thing for any building and from the engineering perspective. I think uh, we're going to find when this study comes back from Bowen and Collins, we're probably one to three million dollars for each the public safety for the fire station and for the old rec center. If they are on the high end of that, $6 million for the combined, and the new building was only going to be about $12 million for the bond, you know, about 16 total, 14 total, I think. Um, it'd probably be more economical to start with a new building, but it should be phased construction with a specific need and then expand out from there. I find it interesting that, uh, you know, two years ago we were told that this was a extremely significant need. It was our top priority, bar none. Um, so much so that they were willing to impose the tax increase without a vote. Uh, with the citizens' response, they chose not to. Um, you know, it's obviously a priority, but now suddenly, this year, it's different. It's, it's not the priority. Roads are the priority. And in fact, they're a far bigger problem, dollar volume-wise, and need serious attention. Actually, again, false information. It is still a priority of the council. And roads are a priority, public safety is a priority. We have many issues going on in our, city, in our city, and we can tackle them simultaneously. We don't need to wait three or four years in between each, each issue to get it going. So, yes, we are tackling these issues, and it's taking time. We're taking a break. We don't have plans to put the bond back on the ballot this year because we need time for the community to come together and get behind the plan that we're going to support. So it is a priority, and I'm, I'm saying as a council member, this is my priority, and I've heard from other council members as well who are currently sitting on the council, that it is a priority of the city to solve this issue. The need has not gone away, and we need to help our first responders and the community get behind the building that they, that they can support. So it is a priority in our city. Blaine, Blaine, do you have anything you'd like to clarify in your position there or anything? Um, not really. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, continuing on. Done. Well, as far as priorities go, I think the first priority is... Talking to the mic, otherwise uh, we'll get, we'll get a... I'm not talking to you. Yeah, I don't, I don't matter. As far as I can't even vote. <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as priorities go, um, I, I think it's not the top priority, but I think more than one thing can be handled at the same time. The top priority is to look at the budget, see how much money might exist in the budget so that we can go and put that towards the building before we come to the people and say how much more money we need besides that to do the building. I believe we do need a new building personally and I would work toward that and I have worked toward that. I must say just because I love your answer. So, uh, it's very, very, very high. Uh, we've seen that from the citizens. I have a survey on my website, only 100 people have taken it so far, but it's still the top top generator on the website, followed by economic development and roads. Can we handle all three at once? Yes, we can. That's our job as city council, to take on that. Um, following columns, we know what the results are, but Sid and I can't tell you what those results are. We have to respect the privacy that uh, we're held to right now before it comes out on Wednesday or Thursday. Yes, it's very definitely the priority, and there needs to be more than one thing going at once. There needs to be three, two or three priorities. Yeah. 
So that, I agree, it is definitely a priority if you have not been down to see what the conditions are that the firemen are living in, you want to check it out. We need to resolve it, but it can be done within a reasonable budget. I talked with several citizens about this. A gentleman I met the other day, um, he works for Salt Lake County Fire Department, and he said they recently built a new fire department out there. They spent 500, five, 500 million, and he said, 500, 5 million. <laughs> <laughs> and he said it was way above and beyond what was even needed there, so I know we can do it. Yes, the public safety building is one of my priorities. So is roads, and so is the infrastructure. But the point is, it is not really my priority. It is the citizens' priority and what they are willing to pay for. So. Is that the last one? Sorry, I'm getting confused. Go no. <laughs> no. Um, we're in our fourth quarter, so we're, we're almost to the end. Thank you. Um, the next question, let's go ahead and talk about roads. Um, okay, I, your roads are a joke, Pleasant Grove. I'm sorry. Like, I'll tell you that. I'm, I'm a Lehigh resident, um, and uh, I spend more time in Pleasant Grove than I do anywhere else, and it's because my, my business is here. And there are roads that I consciously avoid. Um, and these are regular public roads. I mean, what are you gonna do? Like, that something's gotta, something's gotta happen. I mean, I, I'm even kind of a libertarian sometimes, and honestly, I mean, your roads have gotta get fixed. So what are you gonna do? That's my question. Uh, you've got 90 seconds, um, and uh, we need to have a solution on this from the outside looking in, so what are you, what's your plan on roads? Starting with you, Matt. Or was, is it your turn, or was it Blaine's turn? Okay, Blaine's turn. Um, how much time do you have? You have 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Okay. Well, Rhodes, uh, as you said, if I say your name, do you get more time? <laughs> no. Rhodes are a big issue here. Uh, you know, this year, the city council uh, identified it as the number one issue, and it's a very big one. Uh, we're talking $100 million over 20 years, uh, very, very significant issue, and you probably have similar numbers uh, to deal with the water infrastructure under the roads. Um, we have, I believe, a spending problem, and our cost of providing services has nearly doubled in 10 years. And we still have the persistent roads problem, we still have water infrastructure problems, we still have a public safety building problem. I'm finding it hard to understand why our costs have risen at, at such a rate. Um, and as a matter of fact, the disparity between the departments that are getting the increases year over year and what we're putting into roads is quite significant. As a matter of fact, the budgets that have been passed over the last four years have allocated the smallest amount to roads in any of the the last 10 years. And so roads are being neglected, and it's a big problem here. We've got to start immediately solving it. So when I ran last last election, uh, there, were, there was not a lot of talk about public safety. There wasn't a lot of talk about roads. Because for the first time in many, many years, this council has the guts to tackle the tough issues in our city, which are public safety and roads. Because it's going to cost money as a community to fix those issues. In 2013, the city council began allocating another $198,000 towards our road. That was not happening before 2013. We have hired a firm to come in. They've analyzed the condition of our current roads. We have a plan in place. And the last step is to code you as a community and say, what level of service do you want for your roads? So to say that we have not made this a priority, to say that we not have, have not addressed this, is not correct. We're the first council in many years to address this issue, and that's why you're hearing it so much in the past two years. It's going to take some time, and we're going to need your help in determining the level of service that you want from the roads. But as I said, we've hired the firm, we've done the study, we've analyzed and graded the roads, we know what needs to be fixed and what priority, and now we're, we need to come to the community and say, how do you want to pay for these roads? As a community, all of us, because we all drive on the roads. But to say we have not addressed that is not accurate. 
as a council member, I understand I've done on the same road as all of you do, and they are bad, and we need to address the infrastructure as well. And as I said, as a council, we have talked about this multiple times in council meeting. We are addressing the situation along with many others that we have in the city, and we're making it a priority. But to say that we're not addressing it is inaccurate, as well as the spending problem, that's not true. And I'll give you those stats in just a minute. But there's data to prove that the graphs that have been shown or handed out to you are not accurate. <coughs> Okay, so first thing is what's needed, the roads need to be repaired, and so does the infrastructure. So you have to have a plan for that. As we talked about, that could be as much as $200 million for both of them. And so I haven't seen the new plan or what that number ends up being, but I assume it's something in that ballpark. So you have, to, you, know, you have to present a plan to the people, and I've come up with one that takes too long to go through all the details, but basically it's... I think we can go through the monies we have and get more than a million dollars in against the road budget now. And so I would, I'd go and challenge every department to help. If they could only reduce 10%, only 10% of their area and get that much more efficient in everything we do, of a $35 million budget, that'd be three and a half more million dollars we could put in it before we come back to the citizens. So I would want to look at everything like that as part of this plan that was talked about and make sure that we come back to the citizens and say, this is how much is needed, this is how long it'll take, this is how much the city can, can tighten the build up to get there, and citizens, this is how much more is needed from you, uh, is it a go? And then let the citizens decide. In the meantime, still come up with something that we can get going with it. We can sell off some of these houses that we have and put some of that money in there. We'll be paying off a bond pretty soon in a couple of years. Let's not give that bond back, but let's move that over to road. That's seven hundred forty thousand dollars a year that would add to it. The roads didn't happen overnight. We could have done something in the past, did we? We didn't. So now, what are we left with? We have to start somewhere, and that somewhere is now. As a city council member, we're willing to take that on right now, along with public safety. We may get raked over coals for it. But we're going to come to you as citizens and discuss those needs and the level of source that we need in our roads and that we want in roads. I wrote down some figures here. 2008 is when we took out some bonds. that took away a lot of our Class C road funds that we were able to put towards roads. Those, that bond comes up in uh, 2018, January. So that puts that money back in our hands to help you as citizens with our roads. By 2018, we have the opportunity to have about $1.7, $1.1 million to start putting towards our roads. Now, does that fix things? No. We need to figure out what, what we can do. We have a payment uh, study that's out on my website and the city's website that we commissioned JDB to go look at our roads. What, what can we do to fix our roads and what are the costs associated with that? We're asking Lewis and Young to go look and see what Cove is doing and see if that is something we can consider. So is the city council standing by and doing nothing? No. We're anxiously engaged in doing what we can to help our community fix our roads. There are some roads, KTS. I don't like driving down. Maybe we can get Casey to move here on the other side. <laughs> Lynn Walker, again, maybe being a little repetitive, we have to be going now. Uh, every day costs you money on the ones we film and on those roads. Again, the longer we delay, the more it costs. And it's you and I that are paying that cost. We need to, again, simplify Determine the level of service that you want, and we want to pay for it, and you're willing to pay for it. Then go out, complete the plan, look at the cost, set up the transportation fee with the public, with their approval, and move forward. Joe Butt. I recently saw an email. It had a picture of the what we should do with our roads, and then somebody had gone through a pot of little flowers and all the potholes, and that was a big solution. Um, we, I agree with what has been said. We've got so much. There, there's all kinds of things that we can look at. I'm not well aware of how much it's going to cost, how much it's there's being spent. I said I'm very new to this, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I have an answer. Um, but they need to be addressed, and I would go forward and see what, as citizens, what you want to have done. We need to continue to get, have a, an analysis done and see what we can do. 
I have to say, when I, I attended um, the retreat and, and listened to some of the proposals about our roads, and it literally took my breath away. The overwhelming cost of our roads has, um, is, is very horrific. The city has um, talked about proposing a $4 million budget every year for the next 23 years, and that is to get our average up to a good, that our roads average, which maybe does not solve all our problems, but it does raise all our roads up. Um, the funding um, for the roads is um, one is that there, were, there is a bond that is taking the um, majority of our funding right now. So we're not able to keep up with just the basic maintenance of our roads. So to try to increase and, and repair our roads um, is not being addressed yet. Um, we have the gas tax that is going up next year. And we also have a proposal for possibly a county sales tax that will be possibly on the ballot this November which is mass transit for roads. Between those two, we're looking at about $560,000 a year to go towards our roads. And with all the different revenues and all the different things that we, our city currently has to, to, make, to actually hit the $4 million a year in the budget, we're going to be about a million dollars shy. And these are hard, hard discussions that we have to have because this is, this is up to the citizens to decide what they want to do about our roads. Because we're talking about a huge amount of money that we may or may not get you know, from taxes. But we're raising our taxes already to try to fund these roads, and we still don't have enough money. So silently raise your hand if you've seen a road paved, cut up, and then fixed again. <laughs> okay. I think this is a lack of vision and forward thinking. We need to overlay the subsurface infrastructure where those repairs need to be done with the road repairs. You put those graphs basically over the top of each other, you identify where the subsurface needs fixed, where it doesn't, you can start fixing the roads in the place where the subsurface does not need fixed, and you can start ripping up the roads and fixing the subsurface where both of them are going to need repair. When you're going back and forth and trying to do one and the other, you're just making the, the degradation of the roads even higher. When we put in the secondary water system, we essentially, in my opinion, reduce the lifespan of our roads by about 50%, which is part of the reason why we're in the condition that we're in. Um, we, uh, someone has mentioned that we have added about $200,000 a year to the budget, I agree, and I think that's still well below the additional $3 million per year that is needed. So something has to happen to be able to raise that amount up, so we're allocating about $3 million more per year to be able to get the, the roads to an acceptable level. Uh, Matt, so with city staff and the mayor, what would the, that conversation take? How would that? How would you envision that conversation taking place as a city council member about the subsurface roads and that kind of discussion? I mean, what does that look like with a city staffer? The, uh, in my opinion, the mayor and the city council need to basically go to the public works director and the city administrator and ask them, say, okay, we need a map. We need to know what subsurface infrastructure needs fixed. We map it out. Do the same thing for the roads, and then you just take that. If you do it in AutoCAD or some other drafting program, you can do it what's called an overlay right over the top of each other, and you can identify right away which ones are coinciding and which ones aren't. Start your plan there so you don't have to keep going back and forth and ripping up the roads again. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, yeah, please. Go ahead. If anybody wants to echo for just a second, this doesn't penalize your 60 seconds that you get for your to, to say that the numbers are inaccurate is uh, a bit of an overstretch. Um, you know, I sat in a meeting uh, with the person who made the accusation, uh, the mayor, our city finance director, and our city manager, and we reviewed uh, some charts and these numbers that are being referred to. Uh, everyone agreed, the mayor, the city manager and the finance director agreed that these are real numbers. Uh, they come from the audited financial statements of the city. And so to say that they're inaccurate really is saying that the audited financial statements of the city are, are inaccurate. Um, to the roads issue, you know, the budget that was just passed uh, began July 1. Uh, continue the spending patterns of the past, even after we have identified that roads is the number one issue and needs to be spending $4 million a year to help improve the quality of our roads, we're spending $500,000 to $700,000 a year on roads maintenance. So there's a big gap there, and the new budget doesn't... Wait, I'm going to give you about 10 more seconds. 
doesn't even begin to address that. It continues the same uh, increases in the other departments with nothing additional added to Rose. Anybody else want anything? Okay. okay. The meeting that my opponent is referring to was a meeting in which the agreement was that the numbers were accurate, the way it was presented was misleading to the public, and the mayor agreed with me and so did other people in the room. The road issue is being addressed. Do we need more money for roads? Absolutely, we're not the only city. That's why the state legislature earlier this year, the gas tax was approved, gas tax was approved to give us an additional $188,000 a year towards roads. We are not the only city dealing with this problem. So I'm asking you as citizens to please do your research when you see graphs, when you see numbers. We have a 95 page budget. And when you are given a graph that has numbers on it, you need to ask some questions in the history behind that. There's a lot of information behind those graphs that, that you're being shown that need to go straight back to our uh, finance director, Dean Lundell, and to our city budget. There's a lot of information in there that you're not being shown or not being given, or they may be the correct numbers, but they're being presented in a misleading way. And our roads, we are addressing those issues. We're working on that. It's going to cost a lot of money to do that, and we're taking that one step at a time. And as the mayor said, we're swallowing it one bite at a time. It's too big of a picture to take $200 million of the roads and fix them all. 10 more money. seconds. So we're taking this one step at a time. We're getting your input every feet, every step of the way, and we are addressing the road issue. Okay, we're going to go to Eric, and then here at the end, and then got to go Okay. Oh, Dole, do you, do you want to turn? <laughs> <laughs> You're not pond scum. Okay, go ahead. All right. So you can see what's happening here, um, and it boils down to good decision making isn't about knowledge and just data. It's about understanding that data. And you know, that's where I feel I can come in and help. I've got over 40 years of experience of kind of bringing these situations together. If we need $200 million, let's use that as a ballpark number, that's a lot of money. You know, I got my tax bill like you guys did. We don't pay much into the city tax. It's like $240 is all. And so, you know, that's not very much money. So if you divide 12, $200 million into, you know, the 20 years, into the month, what's going to happen is you're going to have $100 a month increase on your mortgage bill. People can't afford that. Um, so I vote that we, you know, that somebody gets in there, work with the other cities, go out and try to collectively have a big street project going on between other cities too, and see what companies will bid that thing competitively so we can get that percent down too. And there's other things I want to say. I'm giving you guys 45 seconds, those of you that want to follow up. Okay. So there's some simple things you have to look at when you look at the city budget. And it's pretty straightforward. And even Dean Mundell, when I talked to him, he invited all the citizens who want to. He, he'll do a class. He'll set up a class. It can be 20 minutes, 30 minutes, hour, whatever you want. And he'll walk through these budgets with you and show you night and day what's going on. We have to remember, public works budget is a separate budget from the roads. Class C road funds is our road budget. That's where the money's come from. In 2008, like I said again, the, but, the, the bond was issued for our roads. It took up a lot of our Class C road funds. In 2018, those will free up and we will have that money available to us. <coughs> All of the utilities uh, are of different budgets. They're all enterprise accounts. And I don't think very many people in here in this field do understand that. John, I had 50 years of experience as a driver. I'm sorry that you don't understand that we have master plans in effect for all utilities. I tell you, this city is on the ball and moving forward fast. Okay, you were mentioned my name, plus you want time, so you get, I, I was say, you I have, get a minute. I, I have reviewed the master plans, and I don't think we're on the wrong path with them at all. I just think we need to have some more vision thinking and, and overlay the city, which is all I was referring to on that, so we're not doing the work twice. Um, I did want to say for the, the question on the accuracy of the graphs, I did not make them. However, before I started showing them to anybody else, I did what was suggested. I went down and I met with Dean Lundell. And in my meeting with him, I, I got a better understanding of city finances, which I still don't understand. Um, and I did see the, there were some small differences, but the overall accuracy of the graph is, to me, it, it, it is correct. And so from my meeting with Dean Lundell, that's what I got out of it. So I encourage each of you, if that's the case, to go down and meet with him and see if there's something that you don't like in there. Okay. Anything else? Anyone else? Okay, good.
All right, now we're going to talk about three more issues that are really important, and we're going to give them each 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> two hours go so fast when we're having a party here in Pleasant Grove. Um, okay. Economic development, 30 seconds, what's your game plan? Uh, we've talked a little bit about it with tax policy, but let's go ahead and focus on just economic development, 30 seconds, I uh, said. The good news is sales tax revenue generated here in Pleasant Grove is up 17.5%. Our economic plan is working because we're meeting here in doTERRA tonight, and they're part of an incentive package that we offer to anchor and be an anchor company to come to Pleasant Grove. We've seen numerous businesses come to Main Street in Pleasant Grove, Firebird, Chevy's, Coco Lido's, Cravings Cupcakes, Cravings Bistro, Jimmy John's, Walmart. We have a new Thai house opening. We have doTERRA. We have The Void, which is formerly known as Evermore. We have 20 acres coming to be developed just on the north side of the freeway, 20 acres of retail and office. It's coming to Pleasant Grove, and that 17.5% increase shows that it's working. So, I, yeah, I worked with um, a little while until he passed away with our economic developer. And uh, you know, we, what I'd like to see is some kind of businesses come in. We wanted, I wanted to get with him and go down to Sam's Club and bring in the Sam's Club because from that, all these other businesses grow. And I, I want to see some big, meaningful, revenue-drawing places come in. And we are getting some, and that's great news. Um, even if we get everything that's forecasted to come in, you know, regrettably, it's not going to be enough to take care of all the needs of the city. So economic development is a great issue for Pleasant Grove. We have it coming. St. John's Properties is going to be breaking ground September 15th, down by BMW, bringing the retail and commercial that we so deeply want. Now, does that solve all the problems that we discussed? Fully built down, $4 million in sales tax? No, it doesn't, but it helps offset some of the costs for our city, to us as citizens. Um, our downtown is more vibrant and exciting. My wife and I love walking downtown and visiting the shops and the food places there. How great it is and the exciting things that are happening in the city. Yeah, things are on the move, but I'm getting old enough that it's so difficult for me to remember all those new businesses. So I'll say, <laughs> what's this <laughs> <laughs> But I think I like that we've been building more businesses. I think we need to continue to build businesses so we can get that revenue. And um, we, the city owns quite a bit of property. If it's necessary, maybe we need to look at selling some property so that we can get a revenue off of that and then use that means to go to, to our expenses. The economic situation in our city is getting a lot better. And um, I'm on the planning commission, so I now get to take a part in uh, promoting and getting those uh, businesses to get through the process to uh, start developing in our city. So I have the pleasure of doing that. Businesses look at the roads and the economic development plan of the city when they choose to deal to go into one. If we do have in Pleasant Grove an economic development plan, I can't find it. So first off, I want to have a formal, written, published economic development plan. With the information that, that I've, I've heard that if we do fully develop, we're going to gain about $4 million per year for an economic development plan. My estimate is that it's going to cost about a million dollars to be able to support the increased growth. So we only have $3 million per year in 35 years when we're fully developed. I'm all in favor of an economic development plan. Uh, we definitely need one. Uh, we have some businesses coming in, but the city's own study shows that it doesn't solve our problem. Uh, while we would love to have an additional $4 million in budget, it takes 35 years to develop that. And at the current spending rates, uh, the increase in spending would far consume uh, that additional $4 million over 35 years. So you have to be able to control spending and you've got to then blend that with an economic development plan to bring in more revenues. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I know that's a very important issue, and I encourage you to take time to chat with the candidates and get more of an understanding of their vision on that issue. This one's going to be a 15-second question. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> this will be pretty easy and straightforward. Um, and we'll start with Don, and then work our way this way. 
Um, do you think our current city code is in need of more regulations, it's just right, or needs less regulations in it? I, I don't work with that. Um, I'd have to look into that. So anything I ever hear at all the council meetings seems to go fine for what I'm happy with it. Okay. So we're working in the past in the downtown advisory board, planning commission, and now city council. We need more streamlined for our businesses. We need to be able to come in and make it easier for them. Okay, so <laughs> I'm unfamiliar with what our city code on is, and so instead of trying to assume and make myself look intelligent and make an idiot of myself, I'll be um, I'm not in favor of more regulations. Um, our current um, code, um, the <coughs> issue I have with it being on the planning commission is the conditional use permits that we do. And I think that that needs to be looked at. I think that comes down to a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, the fact that the accessory apartments have been so long, we still don't have a code for that. We do need to have something set up for that. Um, and on the other hand, we have a code that says we have to have our cat on a leash when it's on our property. So, a little bit too much there, you think? <laughs> no noises, audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we clearly, I think, have, have too much regulation. Um, we've seen that with businesses trying to come in. It has been a real conflict. Uh, I've heard from various developers that it's just too hard to work with Pleasant Grove uh, and some of the restrictions that they, they give them. So I think we can simplify that. Again, misinformation. We never said you, can ha you can't have your cat on a leash or you can. The code actually is that your animal just needs to be on a leash outside of your property if it's not fenced in for the safety of other people, so that's incorrect. As well as there's many codes in the city that we would need to review, again, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, accessory apartments is one. All right. Um, and this is our final question. None of you necessarily use the extension time, um, but because I like to be prompt, let's go ahead and reduce your extension time to 30 seconds. So... I was going to give you 30, you get another 30, so now you have 60 seconds to answer this question, and this is your wrap-up, okay? We don't get a wrap-up? You, you, this is your wrap-up, and I'm gonna, it's going to be on zoning, and then whatever you want to talk about. So I would recommend quickly resolving uh, everyone's concerns about zoning in 30 seconds, and then you have 30 seconds to wrap up with whatever. Um, what is your position on... Uh, the zoning policies here in the city, and specifically on multifamily dwellings and city planning. Um, let's go ahead and start right here at Eric, and then work our way down. So, in my viewpoint, we're done with multifamily high density. We don't need any more. We have too much, as, as stated. I went on a right line with the police a couple of weeks ago, and two-thirds of my time was spent in the high density. We need to do something. Uh, most of our land now out in the Grove is dedicated to commercial and retail, and we need to focus on that. I love Pleasant Grove. I want to see Pleasant Grove move forward. We have a community that's heavily, heavily involved, and we need to realize that we have more than just one issue, two issues, three issues. We have a lot of issues that are before us. And that can't happen without you, the citizens' input. And I look forward to working with you one-on-one, -on -one, emails, phone conversations, whatever it takes. Or if, you, if I come to your house, we can get it done as a, as a community. And that's what I look forward to, because Pleasant Grove is a great place. A lot of exciting things are happening in Pleasant Grove. Economic development is one of them. We just need to look at the sales tax that will increase things happen. So I'm excited to serve you and move forward as Pleasant Grove. Thanks. The, the domain or the multi-family multi dwelling, it needs to be done. And I'm sure it doesn't need to move forward. There are some other, other things. I, I am finding that every time I go to city council meeting, they're rezoning something. And so I'm, I've been learning a lot. I am grateful for this opportunity that I've had, that I stepped forward, although I think it's real crazy. Um, 
I'm learning so much, and as a candidate, I just want you to know that I will continue to learn and to study and to grow and to represent you, to, to come to get to know your concerns, and I just would like to represent this city and help us remember to use a to stick to a balanced budget, to to follow the proper role of government, and to return to to, to quit going into debt for everything that we see as a need and to really look at what is truly a need versus what is just simply a want. Thanks. Um, our citizens have decided that we don't want any more multi-family housing, so our current zoning pretty much shows that. So I don't have an issue with the zoning as far as that goes. Um, the concern I have with zoning and what we have to deal with is when businesses come in, um, they're coming in with ideas and plans that don't fit our zoning. And I think that's where our biggest issue is, is sometimes our zoning um, puts on regulations and asks for things that maybe is not in the best interest of a business coming in, and that complicates things. And that's why we have to continue to you know, adjust our zoning. And I think that we should have more of an open um, philosophy when it comes to especially our commercial area and allowing uh, businesses to come in with their ideas instead of us trying to promote our ideas on top of theirs. I agree with Jennifer a lot of what she said in Eric regarding the public safety and the, the police having to go to multifamily. Um, I think as a city, we need to do more community service activities. We've done some recently, but if we can get more involved, I do not think we have a properly prioritized budget. I think we need to prioritize the essential services first and then do everything that we possibly can to maintain our other non-essential services at the current levels. We spend Basically, it's just under $1,000 per person, the cost to provide services. Ten years ago, that cost to provide services was about $650 per person. I do not know, and I do not understand why that increase has increased so much in the last ten years. That's something that I'm trying to find out so we can figure out what's going on with our budget. If we can get that in line so that our budget is at, at a cost to provide service within a reasonable amount, I think we can do a lot more with what we currently have. Bottom line, if you do not know the right question to ask, you will not get the proper answers. Uh, you know, the zoning issue is, is a little bit of a problem. Um, to get the businesses that we'd like to have in Pleasant Grove, the retail businesses, they need more rooftops. And so they would like to see more multifamily dwellings. The residents of Pleasant Grove would not like to have more multifamily dwellings. So, you know, you've got a bit of a competing interest, and that's a tough issue to deal with. Um, we have a lot of tough issues to deal with here in Pleasant Grove. Um, we have real needs. Um, we, if we follow the, the trend that we're currently on, the only solution available will be to raise your taxes. And not by just a little bit they will be to raise your taxes significantly. And so if we stay on this course, I'm concerned that we become the city of fees rather than the city of trees. I'd like to see us go back to being the strawberry city, uh, back to a day when we lived in a fiscally responsible manner, and I know we can do it. I was one of the council members back in 2012 that initiated a moratorium on high density housing. During that six month moratorium, we went in and changed the zoning from 32 units per acre down to 12. And since that time, we've seen a reduction in the number of multifamily units coming in. I've also recently initiated the council looking at the, the area to make sure it's commercial and not uh, high density. We need every square inch that's left in the grove for sales tax revenue for our city. You've heard a lot of doom and gloom, the sky is falling, spending priorities, we're going bankrupt. It is not true. Let me give you some data. We have an award-winning CPA, Dean Landell. We have extremely low interest rates on our bond. If we were anywhere close to mismanaging our funds, we would not have extremely low interest rates. I'm talking 1% to 4% on our bonds. We have an excellent bond rating. We have a revenue stream to pay off every debt that we owe. We run a balanced budget. We have a surplus. We have a pay-as-you-go system for many of our funds that our finance director has created. It's not doom and gloom in the city. It's positive. I'm optimistic. I think we can handle these issues together in a positive way and not have everyone scare toxic, scare toxic starting scared about what's going on in our city. Where do you find $100 million for the roads? It's out of order. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was my Republican chairman parliamentary procedure coming up. <laughs> hey, continue, Tom. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm too for 
knocking off the high density housing and stuff. But what I like here is I, I love my country. I'm a disabled Vietnam veteran, and uh, and, and I want to. I was willing to give my life then. I'm willing to give it now. But I love seeing democracy in action tonight. Thank, thank everybody here. Thank all of you. I want to thank you for leaving your homes and your families and coming here and the effort that you put in tonight so that you can learn more about each of these candidates, um, sort out our experiences, our education that it will take to lead Pleasant Grove. We need all of the citizens of Pleasant Grove to care like you guys do. We all need to be registered to vote. Then we need to make a hard decision of who to vote for. Um, because of you and people like you, this city will be a blessing and it will be blessed and prosperous. Remember, we are citizens of Pleasant Grove. We have a unique responsibility to do the task, the hard task of electing the right people to lead Pleasant Grove. And over the next four years, through some of the toughest financial decisions that we're going to make. So if you're a registered voter, go out and find someone who's not a registered voter. If you're now enlightened and know more about it, find someone who's not enlightened. I ask you to, each of you to join the community of informed citizens and do the hard work and the hard task of electing the people to the city council. And when you do this, this will define what our city is about. God bless Pleasant Grove and God bless the United States of America. Don, I, I let Don go a little bit longer because I could see his statement, and so I knew how much longer we had to go. So, but, and that was great. Thank you so much. Um, if we could please, if candidates, you could start gathering up your things because I'm going to let you guys escape out to your booths so you can meet people as they leave. If we could all please give these candidates a big round of applause. officer posted and we need to be safe. I knew that wasn't true. Pleasant Grove is an incredible place. Um, candidates, go ahead and gather your things and walk out there. If you guys could let them get out first, and then uh, we'll step out. Just a quick housekeeping item. If you do want to send a thank you to doTERRA, this was a really wonderful uh, offer for them to let us use this facility tonight. Um, the second thing is if any of you have any suggestions or ideas for ways that we can uh, that I could do a better job in the future. I welcome that input. Uh, my email is kccasey at discoveryspacecenter.com. Um, if you really hated the way I did it, that's okay too. You're anonymous, I'm not. Um, and, and then the third thing is, uh, yeah, this city, this is a special place. I've loved it here. I have more memories from my childhood here at the Space Center and Purple Turtle, I think those are the two things the city's known for, um, than, uh, than anything else, and I, I'm grateful to this city for being an awesome place. So, thank you guys. Go ahead and follow the candidates out there and ask some questions. and questions. Um, well, the, the questions, I have a stack of questions that were submitted.